The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. O'Brien. Good Friday morning, everybody. I'm Tommy O'Brien, coming to you live from TFNN. Thanks for starting your trading day off here at TFNN. We got markets this morning following some producer price indexes, negative territory, but barely in the red. We're talking about basically where we were at the lows of yesterday. S&P's off by 12 right now, 44.73. You see the volatility on that 8.30 PPI number, a little bit of lower price action across the board. NASDAQ 100, you're off by 87 points. And I should mention, quite the slide yesterday, all the indices kind of getting right below the lows we had intraday yesterday. NASDAQ 100, right at those lows as well. We're off by more than half a percent in the NASDAQ 100, 15,115. The Dow, off about one tenth percent. The Russell off about one tenth percent as well. So interesting, right? You got the S and P's off a quarter percent. The Dow getting hit off six tenths percent, and the Russell and the Dow barely in the red. Crude, eighty three fifteen. We're up by thirty three pennies this morning. You jump over to gold. Pretty calm action so far. We're flat for the session. We were up to nineteen fifty three. Gold catching a little bit of volatility on that data as well. And what do we got? So interesting how notes and bonds are trading, man. Right, so interesting. This is the most interesting part of what's going on in this market right now. Even backing things up on a 10 minute, you back it up to the jobs number one Friday ago, you're at 109.24. You trade up two full points, and we almost got it all back. Two full points up, two full points down in the last five days almost, folks. We again have lower price and higher yield with the 10 year off by 13 ticks. You see that acceleration going on in the PPI number right now. And what do we got? We got a little bit of a hot PPI number. So, what's that doing? That's boosting rates, that is boosting the dollar, and that is weighing on commodities, and it's weighing on the equity market right now. And let's just jump right over. Why not to that number? Producer price inflation picks up on boosts from services. Seems like this article could be written uh, for the last 18 months, right? Services, et cetera. This is PPI, so it doesn't always translate down to CPI, but to some degree, it's inflationary pressure just a little bit higher on the supply chain picked up in July primarily due to certain uh, strength in services categories after downward revisions to the prior month's figures excuse me producer price index for final demand rose 0.3 percent last month the PPI advanced 0.8 percent from a year earlier reflecting a less favorable comparison with the index a year ago you check out where we at a little bit of a spike there July increase reflected pickup in services costs while goods Prices barely rose. And you look at the change. That's the first time we've had a little bit of a pickup on that curve in a while. We're up by 0.3%. Services costs rose by the most in nearly a year, reflecting increases in categories including portfolio management, outpatient care, and passenger transportation. So I guess it is a little bit of a different story in terms of services. Several categories from the PPI, notably healthcare, seems to be the big one there, are used to calculate the personal consumption expenditures price gauge which is what the Fed prefers to follow for inflation. That's going to be released later this month. Within healthcare, you had inflation in hospital outpatient care and nursing home care accelerating. Meanwhile, physician care costs were little change. Brokerage services and investment advice, a category that also feeds into the PCE, jumped in July. So what you're seeing in here, the reason why I read through all of that, this could translate into the PCE, which is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. Okay, so you've got some hot areas of the economy right now which could translate to a PCE number that we're gonna get later this month for July that the Fed most closely follows when it comes to data points that illustrate what inflation is doing. Uh, so here are the numbers. PPI, month over month, a little bit hot, 0.3 versus 0.2. Excluding food energy, core, 0.3 versus 0.2. Year over year, 0.8 versus 0.7. And then core year over year, 2.4 versus 2.3. So you get a little bit of a beat there. They go over those numbers yet again, that number out at 830. And yeah, we're gonna get a whole extra data point of months or a month before the Fed meeting, which is so interesting, right? All of this data coming in right now for July, we're even talking about right now, it's August 11th, 
this PPE number is probably going to translate into a PCE number that we're going to get later this month for July. Meanwhile, we're going to get August before that September meeting as well. So don't make up your mind just yet. I think the numbers are probably in line just enough for them to be able to pause one more time. They would never tell you, Chairman Powell, if they were going to go every other meeting, right? But I think that was probably a reasonable guess when you are hiking, you pause, you hike again. Very reasonable to say that you could pause again, still leave the door open for a hike if needed, and that gets you like three or four meetings down the road almost from where you go. So that's the PPI number this morning, and you're seeing a little bit of volatility. And uh, yeah, we got a stronger dollar yields. So interesting, as I said on this one, man. You jump over to the 10-year, we're off by 13 ticks right now. You jump over to the 30-year, we're off by 19 ticks right now. And we jump back to the volatility index with the VIX right now, back above 16 at 16.07. All right, checking back to those commodities too. Yeah, crew dropping a bit. We got a strong dollar. And the gold contract dropping a bit. All things considered, we've had quite a bounce. Like, So compare gold right there, right? It's been a one-way trip, man, from 2010 to 1957 recently. And you jump over to the dollar index, though, going back 10 days. And look at the volatility we've had. Right. Not exactly a trend in the same degree. So something's going on there beyond just the dollar index, because the dollar index right now is back to where we were trading at basically last Thursday. And compare that to the gold contract when you were 20 to 25 dollars higher from where we're trading at right now almost. So something's going on in those, whether it's the currencies or the commodities themselves, because if it was just trading off of the dollar index, it wouldn't be doing that same comparison. You jump over to the yen, that's part of it as well. But even the yen, not quite where we're at right now compared to where we were last Thursday. So there's part of it. The yen, it's interesting that not all the components are as big of a factor into the gold contract. And the yen really illustrates thing in the yen. Yet again, we're getting higher price action for the yen up to 144.81. You take a look at that thing on a daily, coming right up to those recent highs that we had back in the end of June for the yen at 145 almost. All right, let's check out how some of the FANG stocks are trading this morning. As we got a little bit of negative action in the market, we got Amazon shares down almost a dollar right now, still hovering pretty much where they spiked to on their earnings about a week ago, sitting at 137.64. We jump over to Apple shares. Yeah, barely in the red this morning. Microsoft shares right now trading down. Look at Microsoft down about a couple bucks. And we jump over to Google. Google shares right now down about a dollar as well. I was watching a YouTube video last night and just had part of, I believe it was Larry Page. It could have been Sergey Brin. I forget which founder it was of Google. And he was talking about when he was at Stanford starting Google. And the way that he started it is that they just realized nobody was tracking URLs on the Internet. Him and one of his professors. So, as you know, that'd be pretty cool if we start tracking URLs on the Internet. And then from there, they used all that data because he loved data points, he said. And I think they got like five, ten billion data points or something like that. I'm sure it's many, many more now. But that illustrated that they took that data and from there they were able to generate a search function of the URLs that were on the internet because what did he do? Because he had the data. And it made me think, you know, it's all about the data, right? He started it as a project. He said, I thought it could be a good dissertation maybe for my PhD. I track all the URLs. What did it turn into? The data turned into uh, one of the wealthiest people in the world. Start Google. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about Google's uh, cash pile when we get back. Stay tuned, folks. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years 
years' experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. We get markets trading a little bit lower this morning following a little bit of a hot PPI number. Uh, as I mentioned, though, we got a lot of data before that September meeting. Rates popping around right now. We got the 10 year pushing about 4.15% right now. The yield on the 10 year. We're taking a look at Google. Google shares off about a dollar right now, 129.50. We back things up on a daily. Quite the acceleration on their last earnings. They hit quite a number in terms of accelerating on the AI craze as well. We're off of lows to start the year at about $88 for trading at 130. Now I go over that in the context of $108 billion cash pile. Quite a problem to have. And take a look at how this thing has accelerated, man. So last quarter brought in nearly twice the cash spent on buybacks. Apple's capital return strategy is less defined than its peers. Excuse me, Alphabet's capital return strategy is less defined than its peers, right? You have Apple with huge buybacks, all those plants that go out, many Microsoft, I'm sure, to the same degree. Google, not quite the same deal right now in terms of how much cash they have and then what they're going to do with it. Google is left with $118 billion. They generated nearly $29 billion in cash in the 90 days of their last quarter. Absolutely remarkable, man. Apple has $167 billion. Crazy that you got Google, man, pushing on the heels of Al Alphabet when you're talking about those types of numbers. However, unlike Apple, which aims to give back most of its cash to shareholders via buybacks and dividends, Alphabet has a less clearly defined capital return strategy, leaving investors seeking more detail on its plans. I bring it up because you know the market loves when they just give that cash back to you and take a look at this chart. That is cash from operations and do you notice a trend there? Boy, that is quite a trend. Now, here's all I'll say. That is some growth priced into this equity, man, okay? You don't have to go back that far to the years of 2015 and 2016, okay? For some context here, folks, yeah, I have to do it in my own head. Yeah, Trump was elected in 2016. It just pushes, right? So he serves four years to 2020. It just brings back events to no degree. Because I look at the market where it was then, right? Everyone says, oh, the market's in so much trouble. No, I think the S&P was at like 2,200 at that point. And it was like, oh, Trump's getting handed over this amazing economy. The S&P is at 2,200. Meanwhile, Google was only generating five, six billion dollars in free cash flow from their operations. They're now pushing 20 to 30, 25, 20. 
they've been over 20 for a couple of years now since the pandemic. Does this mediate a bit? I don't know, but that is a lot of cash to say the least. Uh, and they get into it a little bit more. Alphabet, Apple, and Microsoft, all of them $84 billion in the last quarter. You're talking about a billion dollars of cash every single day just between three companies. Yeah. Alphabet has stepped up buybacks, expanded its repurchase authorization to $70 billion in April. But last quarter, the firm spent $15 billion on its own shares, barely half of the cash it brought in. By contrast, Apple in the last five fiscal years has returned almost $5 billion more than the $454 billion in cash it generated. So take a look at how that's probably going to change, right? They're reaching the levels. And all the talk is about Google potentially losing that monopoly. The numbers last time did not say it. They're still pumping out ads, and they probably will be for years to come. But Apple gives back basically even more money than they generate, right? Because they already have $167 billion. Why do they need to grow that cash pile? They don't. Uh, the same thing's about to happen with Alphabet. They just brought in $29 billion. They only gave back 15. It grew by $15 billion. They're at $118 billion. So look for some bigger numbers for them pushing out that more. Yeah, and they even say here that Microsoft, right, they, they purchased Activision Blizzard, Google, not so much in the same degree. They're going to have to give that cash back at some point, and the market loves it, and maybe it's coming the next earnings season. Yeah. Could they initiate a small dividend? We think it's more likely to stick to a buyback approach. Buybacks give you more. Yeah, dividend could send a perception that growth opportunities may not be as strong. The cool part about this conversation, right, and I remember having this conversation with my friends, in terms of when Apple started giving their dividend, right, Let's back it up if we can even find when they started giving their dividend. When they start giving their dividend. Or they end it. It's been happening in a while because they've had so much cash. Is that when it started? Did it start all the way? No, here it did. Yeah, probably started back here. In 2012 or so, right? They really had a good run. You ran from like 6 bucks up to 26 There's their cash pile. That's probably where the dividends began. But you can make a very real case, man, that a growth company should be using that money to grow. And theoretically, that is correct, right? Like, come on, man. You know, you can't do more for those investors if you're Steve Jobs at the helm of Apple. I think Steve Jobs probably had some good quotes, I think, is what I'm thinking of, right? Maybe somebody in the den's got some. I'm pretty sure he had some good quotes about dividends or versus using that money to grow. A visionary like that, man, is not in the business of just handing back cash instead of using it to grow and innovate. But, and it's always great when the but comes, very difficult to do to almost impossible to do when you start reaching that level of cash to use it in a manner that is not wasteful to a certain degree. Now you say that, right? Except why was Apple not the first company to come to market with open AI style chat, et cetera? There's just been innovations where you could do that. Uh, nonetheless, I digress. You take a look at Google shares. It's interesting to look at that cash pile. And when you compare it to some of those other equities, I found it especially interesting that they're going to have to start giving some of that money back, man. You know, those ads aren't going to be drying up anytime soon on Google. They might lose some of that market share, but they are going to be a huge player for some time to come. And they're going to be around on AI. You know, we are at the very forefront of AI and there's no way they spend the billions they do. They're Google. And they're not going to be a competitor when it comes to that to some degree. I don't know how the ad scenario is going to get shaped, though, because it's going to be a different scenario when you're chatting with a chat GPT style chat bot. Because it's not like a search function where you just list a variety of searches and within that search display is embedded ads. I don't know how you do that with an interactive chatbot, and that's what they're going to have to navigate. But $118 billion is what they have between the three biggest companies out there. You're talking about almost a billion dollars a day in free cash flow. Pretty remarkable. All right, let's jump back and see how we're doing as we come into the open right now. We got markets sitting down basically where we were. NASDAQ 100 trailing off a bit. We go back to a 10-minute chart. Dollar index pushing near the highs right now at 102.75. Market, a little skittish on that hot PPI number. And we got yields right now. What are we pushing? Let's see. 
We're talking about a 10-year. Yeah, 4.15% yield on the 10-year as we're coming back to basically the lows of last Friday. I tell you what, folks. Wednesday or even Thursday on the spike higher on the CPI number, did you have that we might be the push in the lows of last Friday? Did you have it? Always interesting how this market can defy what you think can happen. Uh, and look at the NASDAQ 100. You talk about lower lows and lower highs. That's a 10-day chart. Let's back it up 20 days. And let's back it up uh, on a four-hour. Boy, I don't know. That looks like some lower lows and some lower highs from that high of 16,062. What's that mean? We're talking about the 19th of July. Yeah, you make that run up to the highs of the beginning of August. August, not been kind to the market so much. You're talking about 900 points. We're 1,000 points off of the highs that we made just a few weeks ago. Stay tuned, folks. We're coming back for the open. Tigers. Candlestick pattern analysis is a primary tool among successful traders, and you should be no different. Candlestick patterns can demystify buy points, sell points, general price movement, and so much more. At 4 p.m. on Monday, August 14th, trader Teddy Kekstadt will be hosting a live hour-long webinar on Japanese candlestick patterns. Teddy, the author of the Tiger Forex Report, has been trading for 33 years, and candlestick patterns have been instrumental to his success. For just $97, see how to use candlestick patterns to analyze stocks and options in order to capitalize on market swings, increase your odds of success, and decrease your risk. During this live webinar, you will learn when to use and when not to use Japanese candlestick patterns in this volatile market. Dispel the myths about this strategy and see just how much the mastery of candlestick pattern recognition can impact your trading. Visit TFNN.com today. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. NN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious tech, either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. We got the markets open, and you're pushing basically session lows. You opened on the NASDAQ 100. We trade a little bit lower. We're off by nine tenths percent right now, trading at 100, uh, excuse me, trading down 125 points at 15,070. SP's off about half a percent, 44.65. You get the Dow right now off 64 points, trading down just two tenths percent, and the Russell down about three tenths percent. We jump over to commodities, crude. 
82.69. We got to keep our eye on the dollar index today, following that PPI number. Yep, dollar shift in higher. So what do we have? We got higher yields. I'm guessing the 10-year is even lower. There it is, 110.08. And what are we talking about right now, man? We are talking about. Yeah, just that quick, 4.16 rounding up on the 10-year. So we have higher yields, dollar strength, market not liking that at all with the S&P off 23, NASDAQ off about 126, Google off 9 tenths percent, Apple shares down about 4 tenths percent, Microsoft shares almost a full percent in the red. We jump over to Amazon off 6 tenths percent, jump over to Tesla shares down 2 percent so far right now. We're going to jump to the car companies in a second, so why not? GM, yeah, you talk about a trade lower. Not sure why there was a wake-up call yesterday for the potential of this strike to be a problem, man. But it was a wake-up. Nonetheless, check out the price action, right? GM trades lower, Ford trades lower. We jump over to the headline. GM Ford slide as $80 billion union risk hits confidence. Automakers among the biggest decliners in the S&P 500 yesterday. There was a big sell-off, but boy, they had quite a wipeout across the board. Companies may be in the penalty box for a while. One analyst said, yeah, they got to get it resolved. And can you imagine the execs at the car companies when the UPS deal comes across that their drivers are making 170 grand a year? And listen, I think it's great, folks. UPS is making money hand over fist, okay? There's no reason why full-time, call them tenured employees, okay, should be able to use, um, make a, a, a great livable wage for companies that are crushing profits. It didn't used to be the case that you were a lifetime employee for a company that was crushing profits and dominating the world and you couldn't provide for your family. Somehow it's become like this thing. So don't be afraid to question the norm as these are coming down the line. These car companies have made an obscene amount of money recently and their employees want to get paid. So, I mean, all this stuff, right? Talking about even I talked about earlier in the week. Question what you see as the assumed reality just because it's always been that way. The five day work week, even that, okay? If we grew up in a four day work week and somebody said they want you to work five days, you'd say you're crazy. Who came up with five days? We're at four, we still work four and we only get to rest three, right? Can you imagine the conversation if that's how we grew up? Why five versus six? If five is so important, why aren't we working six? We'd be okay, the human, human beings could work six days a week and then just rest one day a week. I'm digressing, but all that stuff, okay? So there's all this stuff, five days. Ah, you don't want to work five days a week, you're lazy. Question what is going on, man. The, the amount of money these car companies are making is obscene, literally. Uh, this article, okay, is going back to their last earnings because I was just looking at it. I want to know, right, how much are these companies making out of curiosity? We know they've been crushing it. This article is from last month on their earnings, okay? They raised the full-year guidance, announced deeper cost cutting. That's GM in there. They're cutting by $3 billion. The earnings included an unexpected $800 million charge for some action that they have going on. But the bottom line is they took in almost $45 billion. And when they talk about how much money they're bringing to the bottom line, for the full year, GM is raising its adjusted earnings expectations for 12 to $14 billion. That's for the year. Up from a previous range of 11 to $13 billion. They also increased expectations for adjusted Automated automotive free cash flow, seven to nine billion, up from 5.5 .5 to 7.5. That's an extra billion and a half dollars, just like that. Net income attributable to stockholders, somewhere in the range of 10 billion, up from somewhere in the range of maybe nine billion, right? So huge numbers. That's just for GM. It doesn't encompass Ford. You got 150,000 employees, is what they're talking about as part of this deal. Uh, and their college for wage increases that could add more than 80 billion in expenses. For each of them, there's the kicker, right? That's quite a price tag, no matter what kind of earnings you're talking about. When you're talking about $80 billion, uh, yeah, nonetheless, some of these numbers, I think they might even state it in here, how much these companies have taken in, man. Now, the kicker is, right, these forecasts that GM put out on this article that I just cherry-picked from last month, uh, contingent on a deal getting done and no big stoppage. So that might be a problem, man, as that is a very real threat. The guidance increase is contingent on GM successfully negotiating new labor agreements with the UAW 
and the Canadian Unifor unions this year without a work stoppage or a strike. I mean, that's totally in play, man. So I think the market waking up to that yesterday, it has been waking up. You put this thing on a daily and you talk about a rip roaring pullback on Ford shares from 1550 to 1218. You take a look at GM and yeah, it's been a rip roaring pullback as well. We just lost 20% uh, on this equity in the span of a month. And the battle's on and, and, and probably rightfully so. You know, these companies are crushing profits. Uh, hopefully they can get a deal done. Last time they had a problem, it was a 40-day work stoppage, I believe. They might even mention it in this article. Let's see. During the last round of bargaining in 2019, yeah, a breakdown in negotiations, 40-day strike against GM. The automaker said the strike costed $3.6 billion. I think the workers got a lot more pull this time around, man. That UPS deal is going to be around in a big way. And... We'll jump to that. That'll be the next article. So then we go to FedEx. You think it's tough being just the United Auto Workers, uh, excuse me, the car makers, right? In terms of the UPS deal gets done. Oh, man, those car makers, they know it's coming. How about being the FedEx execs? How about them, right? UPS pay hikes for package handlers raise pressure on the FedEx. Uh, Teamster deal going to make it tough to reduce turnover. Maintaining labor levels has already been difficult for FedEx. And the tough deal is here. They're already having a problem, FedEx's in this article in terms of especially part-time handlers, right? You're making 16 bucks versus 21. Folks, that's 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 over a 30% pay raise if you're making 16. Percentage-wise, it's bonkers. And it's a 15% pay raise if you're a full-time driver and it goes well up from there. The salaries of the unionized UPS drivers will make under the tentative five-year agreement have grabbed headlines. That's because at year five, they're making 170 grand. Here's the kicker though of that, right? I was playing with this yesterday. You only got to put that number to about 130,000 today. You push it out at 5% a year for the next five years, you get to 170 almost. Ballparking numbers, okay? And 130 is still a great salary. I get it. But what's wrong with workers that are at the higher echelons of a company making $130,000 a year when they've been working there for an extended period of time and they're the backbone of the company? That's where I just never understand how that happens. Um, Ones with a few years experience could earn 50 bucks an hour. The bigger problem for FedEx, okay, and we're going to finish this conversation up because taking a look at these two, man, FedEx, they have a different business model and it's going to be a little difficult for them. The workers in the sorting centers are getting even bigger pay hikes with some increases hitting 55%. Those employees are often part-time. So you're in the sorting center. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Here's me. Here's me. All right, we're going to talk about this when we come back, folks. We're going to take a look at UPS. We're going to take a look at FedEx. Uh, we got car companies lower as well. Markets in the red. Stay tuned, folks. I'll be right back. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com.
Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. We got markets pushing session lows right now. s and is off by 22. We jump back to the S&P chart real quick and check it out. 44.64. We spike on the low to 44.59. But yeah, pushing lower lows uh, off that 8.30 PPI number. We jump back to UPS shares this morning. Talking about UPS versus FedEx. UPS shares off about half a percent right now. We jump to FedEx shares off about six tenths percent. So jumping back to that story for a second. As FedEx navigates this landscape okay of a ups deal it's interesting when you look at who they're paying what they're paying and how they're going to approach the competition that they have coming from ups the part-time employees got some of the biggest pay hikes out there some of them almost 55 percent okay those employees are part-time they work in the sorting centers and they've already been difficult for FedEx to recruit. During the pandemic, the company had to run facilities at partial capacity, which drove up costs and hurt its on-time delivery performance. Okay. Meanwhile, better pay and benefits helped UPS maintain its labor force. Okay. And you take a look at these charts, man. You talk about some volatility, and they've both done well. Okay. But you back it up five years now. Back it up. Put it on a monthly, right? And check out UPS versus you put FedEx. Now this chart going back to about 2000, the FedEx chart going back well before that to 1980, but even zooming it in since 2000, the volatility we've had since 2013, up, down, up, down, up on FedEx, much more so than if you zoom in from UPS where it's basically been chopping around and then the acceleration during COVID and we've chopped around uh, pulling back from the highs of 233. And that volatility, okay, is a factor in terms of a little bit boom and bust in terms of having trouble keeping staff on on difficult times without paying them competitive wages versus what UPS is paying. Now, they've already had problems and it's gonna get even tougher, okay? The ground unit, which does not have unionized workers for FedEx, they've been attempting to lower turnover. And listen, I know we're going through a lot of this, but I gotta get to the last part, which is that they're basically competing with themselves because they don't pay higher wages across the board. Okay. The UPS contract is going to make it more challenging. A FedEx exec told new contractors during a meeting in Orlando last week. Okay. This is the quote. We're going to have to sharpen our pencil a little bit and understand what's going on in specific markets, specifically for package handlers. That's the senior vice president of Western operations for FedEx ground. Here's the kicker. The ground unit cannot raise wages for package handlers too much or it risks luring away delivery drivers that are employed by the contractors. So if they start paying package handlers too much money, the delivery drivers that are working for the contractors are going to say, hey, that's not that bad of a deal because I'm not even getting paid that well. I'll become a package handler. And then the delivery drivers for the contractors will be the ones that they can't get. Right. If we start, if we get too aggressive, then it starts to compete with what you've got going on with your drivers. So we have to be cognizant of that. Instead of just raising wages across the board to a certain degree, they're careful not to raise wages in one job too much, even though markets dictate that they probably need to, 
because if they do that, they're going to actually pull workers away from the other areas of their business where they're not paying them as much money. Not making it up, folks. That's how it's going right now at FedEx. Uh, the UPS contract is going to start wage for handlers at 21 an hour, up from 16. And by the end of the deal, so in five years from right now, in the year 2028, if you've worked as a part-time handler for UPS for 15 years, you're going to make $36 an hour. Folks, if you've worked for a company for 15 years in the year 2028, I hope you're making 36 bucks an hour. You should be, okay? Even if you're part-time. You're talking about 15 years of work for a company that's crushing it. You're talking about the year 2028. So again, don't be wowed by some of these numbers when really we should be wowed by the fact that the federal minimum wage hasn't been raised in forever. Those types of things are really what should wow people. Not that workers for companies that are crushing it are finally getting real livable wages. Because we have an unemployment rate, folks, very low. But as I think we all know, a job is not what it used to be in terms of the level of pay and what came with it. Uh, delivery drivers hired by FedEx Ground typically make 15 to $25 an hour. Delivery drivers, 15 to 25. 15. And you got UPS. Those guys are crushing it, man. Uh, yeah. So that one's going to play out as it goes forward. FedEx is going to face some heat, man. And it'd be interesting to see how that goes. So can you imagine showing up at FedEx, right? And you know that you got your coworkers over at UPS crushing it. And you're making 15 bucks an hour and they're making 170 grand a year. Exaggerating a bit there, but you get the point. All right. We'll get off FedEx and UPS. What else are we talking about today? Let's see what we got pulled up here. What do we got? Yeah, this one's interesting in terms of the Supreme Court blocking the Purdue Pharma $6 billion Sackler opioid settlement. Uh, the Justice Department is going to examine if bankruptcy courts can force claimants to sign away their legal rights in a settlement. And it is interesting in terms of talking about what the Justice Department's arguing here is that it would create the ability for companies to declare bankruptcy, okay, um, and then extinguish legal claims that even have to do with tort law and being liability, right? In terms of a release from liability as a condition of paying that $6 billion settlement, I don't think that should happen either, man. You know? Um, defendants in mass litigation have long used Chapter 11 to drive a resolution and get a fresh start by offering these third parties a release from liability. Bankruptcy courts encourage settlements that can be forged anywhere else. Yeah, the government and other critics argue that by granting releases to third parties, bankruptcy courts are overstepping their mandate of rehabilitating troubled businesses and becoming an alternative to the civil justice system where alleged wrongdoers can avoid jury trials and pressure pl plaintiffs into settlements. I agree 1 million percent, okay? That opiate deal, they knew about it. They knew it was going on. If you look at the numbers, folks, I'll tell you a quick story about that deal because this is how quickly people get in trouble in that opiate deal. I had a surgery. In about 2004, 2003, and everything went well, small surgery, and bottom line, I needed some pain pills because it was a surgery on my spine, and I was at Brigham and Women's Hospital, outstanding hospital. My, um, because it was on the spine, I had a neurosurgeon, okay? The neurosurgeon had a Harvard business card. I'm just trying to say I had some great doctors, okay? This wasn't people peddling pills. I was at Brigham Women and Women's Hospital with a neurosurgeon that taught at Harvard with a business card that had the Harvard emblem on top of it, okay? And these were just coming about, right? OxyContin was just coming about. And what happened was is that they gave me some OxyContin and they also gave me some Vicodin, okay? And I was taking both, I believe, at the hospital. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, they... they I was in a lot of pain and I was doing okay, but when they pushed me out of the hospital, I said, you know, you know, I, I Oxycontin even at the time, it was tough to get from pharmacies sometimes. So I said, I want you guys to give me those pills here in the hospital from that pharmacy so I don't have to fight with them and wait days for it to be delivered. Bottom line is, they gave me a huge bottle of Oxycontin. They gave me a huge bottle of Vicodin. Thankfully, the pain wasn't that good, great and I can't stand really taking those pain pills anyway. You just want to feel good, so I got off them. But I went back for the two-week meeting and... I had been taking OxyContin for about six or nine days. It really wasn't effective. And they said, oh, no, you were supposed to try and stop taking those and then take the Vicodin. Um, yeah, you shouldn't have been taking those. You shouldn't have said, nobody told me that. Yeah, nobody even told me that. I'll finish it up. But, um, there's a lot of liability to go around. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back.
TFNN has just launched their new trading room, the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with the Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In the Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com and hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com and hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. We've got the S&Ps right now chopping around near the lows of the session, down 20 points. NASDAQ 100, you're off by 137 right now. That's 9 tenths percent. The Dow catches a little bit of a bit on the open. You're negative by just 1 tenth percent. The Russell, negative by 2 tenths percent. Let's see how some of those FANG stocks are doing. Apple shares in the red by 7 tenths. So we got the NASDAQ, yeah, basically off 1%. Microsoft's off 1% right now. Tesla off 2.5% right now. We jump over to NVIDIA shares, off 2% right now. So a little negative action. Google shares off about 8 tenths percent right now. So I was talking about the conversation in terms of Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers and how I was prescribed OxyContin in, I think, 2003, 2004, and just how casual and that nobody had even told me how addictive it could be. Thankfully, I didn't even like it. It really wasn't anything that I felt was that great. But I remember leaving that being like, I can't believe they weren't clear to me that I should try to stop taking the OxyContin as quickly as possible and if I need pain medication, go to the Vicodin because I just never did that. I took the OxyContin and then I stopped, which made no sense that they had been that mismanaged from messaging. And then of course it makes sense when you see what happened uh, in the hindsight of that. Now, I was cherry picking a few articles here in terms of the Sacklers. And what's crazy here, right, is that it really shouldn't make sense that you, you do something that's 
so illegal even civilly, okay? Not even talking about the criminality, and boy, that could be a conversation, I'm sure, that many see the criminality of pushing out these pills, claiming they're not addictive, opioids infecting everybody, okay? Is that this family's worth probably 10 plus billion. They have 11 billion in here. The settlement's only 6 billion. You gotta pay that 6 billion over a number of years. And the case here is saying, how can a bankruptcy judge, judge have the authority to prevent plaintiffs from taking legal action against the owners of a company who had not themselves sought personal bankruptcy protection? And that is one of the kickers of that, okay? So the family doesn't have to declare it. You just have company declaring it. The family has their wealth. The company goes to BK. That money gets facilitated. Yeah, if I had $11 billion, I'd pay $6 billion to get rid of all that stuff too, because they probably shouldn't have anything. We'll end on that one, folks. Stay tuned. We got Basil coming up next, folks. Have a great Friday, everybody.